This program is made possible in part by AARP South Carolina. ETV, the state newspaper, the Greenville News, in association with the Island Packet, the Beaufort Gazette, the Florence Morning News, the Sun News of Myrtle Beach, the Herald of Rock Hill, and the Sumter Item present ETV Debates. Tonight, candidates for U.S. Senate. And now, your moderator, Charles Bierbauer, Dean of USC's College of Mass Communication and Information Studies. Good evening and welcome to tonight's debate for the unexpired U.S. Senate term. We also want to welcome our ETV radio listeners. Joining me tonight to ask questions of the candidates is Andrew Shane of the State Newspaper. And the candidates joining us tonight are Tim Scott, the Republican senator from Charleston, Joyce Dickerson, a Democrat from Columbia, and Jill Bossie, the American Party candidate from Tiga Kay. Before we begin tonight, some easy ground rules. Each candidate will have the opportunity to make a one-minute opening statement, and from there they will have 90 seconds to respond to our questions. If necessary, I'll allow a 30-second rebuttal. We do names when the candidates arrived uh, for the order in which we will start. Senator Scott, we'll begin with your opening statement. Thank you, and good evening. Thank you to ETV for hosting tonight's debate. I am grateful to the people of South Carolina who've afforded me the opportunity to serve them from County Council to the State House, Congress, and now the United States Senate. It is one of the greatest honors of my life. I am here tonight because life has not always been easy, but I've learned some important lessons, met some remarkable people, and have benefited from the strength and the blessings of the great state of South Carolina. Our nation faces many challenges today, but I prefer to see them as opportunities because I believe the best is yet to come. My commitment to you is simple. Every single day, I will work very hard to afford all South Carolinians an opportunity to succeed. My opportunity agenda focuses on education and on jobs. With that, I believe we'll have the tools necessary to succeed. God bless you. Thank you and good evening. <coughs> My name is Jill Bossy. I am not a Democrat, I am not a Republican, I am an American, and I care deeply about what is happening to America. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. We the people need to take control of our government from career politicians <coughs> like my opponents who take their orders from special interests and big money. Tonight, you have the opportunity to interview um, all three candidates and determine who is the best candidate for the role as U.S. Senator. I hope to demonstrate to you this evening that I am not bound by party, by money, or by ideology. I am a public servant. I also hope to demonstrate to you this evening my ideas to fix what is broken in America. I want a better America for our future. That includes a strong economy, good jobs, strong military, term limits, campaign finance reform, and tax reform. I'm asking for your vote, and I hope that tonight you will make the decision on the person and not the party. Thank you. Ms. Dickerson. Good afternoon, and thank you so very much, uh, Andy, for having us here tonight. And Charles, we are so grateful. I am pleased to be here tonight. I am running for the United States Senate because I believe that this is a humbling opportunity for me to present to the people of South Carolina a new idea, a new person who, do, who will always be there for them, who stand for them, who will always want to serve them in every way that they possibly can. So I am focused on our seniors. I'm focused on our veterans. I'm and I'm focusing on women issues. Those are the three main issues that I will be focusing on tonight. And I believe that this is the greatest opportunity for me to represent the people of this state and the nation. So I'm here tonight to ask for the people of the South, of South Carolina, I'm asking for your vote and for your support in, on November the 4th. Thank you very much. Thank you all candidates. Let me start with you, Senator Scott. You got a free pass to the Senate in a sense. Uh, you didn't have to run statewide and now you're running statewide for the first time in your political career. Why should you have the benefit of incumbency? I don't think that the benefit of incumbency is what it used to be. Uh, I've had the privilege of traveling through all 46 counties over the last 18 months. I've spent Monday through Thursday in Washington. I come back home every single weekend. I have a chance to go to my own church, hang out with my grandfather who's 94 years old, take my mom to lunch because these are the reasons why I serve. I look at my nephew and I say to myself, 
I can prepare a future for him. That's why we came up with the Opportunity Agenda. It's an, opportunity, it's an agenda that focuses on education, it focuses on skills in the workplace, and it also focuses on allowing people to earn while they learn. The fact of the matter is that the people that like Washington are very, very few. As a matter of fact, if it weren't for relatives, I'm not sure that we'd be popular at all. So the truth of the matter is incumbency has some major negatives. I look forward to not running on the fact that I'm in office, but running on the fact that I love South Carolina, that I've benefited from being a South Carolinian, from growing up here. I've had the chance, I've had the privilege of seeing people rally around me when I was not doing well in school and standing strong with me and forcing me to look in the mirror and to take responsibility. That has been one of the privileges of being a South Carolinian. So I'm running because there's an opportunity for me to continue to serve from my days on county council, through the state house, being elected twice to Congress, and now having an opportunity to ask you for your vote to the United States Senate. Let me ask a slightly different version of what is essentially the same question to, to the two of you, Ms. Bossie and Ms. Dickerson. Senator Scott has a somewhat tenuous hold uh, on incumbency, but he does have Washington experience uh, that you don't. So why should South Carolina voters give that up, starting with Ms. Bossie? Well, I think what we have to we, what we have to understand is that a lot of the voters these days don't like what's going on in Washington D.C. They are asking for something to change, um, and it doesn't matter whether they're on the right or on the left. Um, I think that the majority of Americans are somewhere in the middle. Um, again, what we've seen go on in Washington with the gridlock, with the hyperpartisanship, with the fighting, it it is n not short of untenable for us as citizens to accept that this is what we are paying our representatives to do. What we want our representatives to do is go to Washington, D.C., sit down, negotiate, talk, find ways to fix what is broken with America. We've got um, a $17.6 trillion debt. We've got an economy that is still struggling along. We need to restore the middle class. They've been eviscerated by the, the Great Recession. We've got to work for our vets. We've got to work for our military. I have got my three of my four children served uh, either served in the military or are serving in the military. And I can tell you, we've got a lot of work to do. I have two sons who are still in active duty stations and could be called up at any time. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So incumbency is too much on how long they've been there. And I am a big supporter of term limits and campaign finance reform. We need more public servants. We need more citizen legislators. And that's why I'm here. Ms. Dickerson, same question. Well, I'm here because I believe in the people of South Carolina, and I believe that it is time for a change, and I believe the people are looking for a person that they that have their interests and not special interests. I am here because the people have asked me as I've traveled all over this count, this state. I've visited 46 state counties in this state, and I've listened to the people. I've heard them talk around their kitchen tables saying how they're having a hard time making ends meet. I'm hearing people say how they're kicked off their insurance. I'm hearing people all over this nation, all over this county, uh, talk about what they need and how Washington is broke and how we, they, we need to fix it. So they're looking for new persons with new ideas to go there to help them, someone that will be their voice, someone who will listen to them and take their interests at heart. So this is why I'm here today running because this is the greatest opportunity to go to Washington. And I, you know, Senator Scott is a great person person, but it is time for a change, and I, it's a challenge that I look deeply forward to, and I'm happy to be here tonight because I believe that I will be the best, best choice to be the voice of the people for the state of South Carolina in Washington, D.C., and that is why I'm here to make sure that their interests are being served and not special interests, and I thank you for the question. Well, I've heard each of you sort of allude to the notion that Washington is broken, and a lot of Americans right or wrong have that perception. What I haven't heard is how you would approach uh, either fixing it or correcting it, changing that, uh, that perception that a lot of Americans have. Could you address that, uh, that, uh, that this thing doesn't work terribly well and you're running for an office that may not be held in particular high regard? We'll start with Ms. Bossie. Thank you. Um, yes, one of the reasons why I'm running as 
uh, a member of the American Party of South Carolina is that, like many Americans, I felt very disenfranchised. I, I felt like both the parties had left me, and I was almost ready to just throw in the towel and say, forget it. Um, but then I found that term limits really addressed my desire to see things change. And as I looked into that more, I came across the American Party, and I also came across the Centrist um, Project. And really, if you think about it, if there are anywhere between three to seven independents in the U.S. Senate. The U.S. Senate is the only body that is still elected by, um, by the, um, the voters directly. And if a majority is denied to both the Democrats and the Republicans, and there are enough independents that can caucus separate from the Democrats and the Republicans, they can begin to create a dialogue that will move us toward what can, be, what can only be um, compromised as um, uh, negotiation and discussion so that we can start to fix the problems and start to come up with solutions um, instead of just um, fighting and kicking the can down the road. I have four grandchildren. I don't want to leave them worse off than I am. I want to make sure that we do for posterity what our parents and our grandparents did for us and quite honestly what the Founding Fathers did for us. And so therefore I think that that's part of the reason why we, we should change and quite honestly I think that they should all go home and we should start all over. It couldn't be any worse than it is. Ms. Dickerson. Well, I'm, I, you know, I'm looking at the fact that we used to have, between there were Democrats and Republicans, there, were, there was a good opportunity for dialogue. But I remember back in August of, of 2009 when the Tea Party rose up. And when that Tea Party rose up, they began to stand in the middle of Democrats and Republicans. And basically what happened was that the Democrats and the Republicans could no longer sit down to the table. They put a divide between the Democrats and the Republicans, which hindered us from having a dialogue. So I believe that, you know, if we uh, delete some of the Tea Party people that are there, I believe we'll have a better opportunity to sit down and have a great dialogue again between Democrats and Republicans. And I don't believe in term limits. I, and at my age, I'll be term limit anyhow. So I'm saying that I am hoping that I will be able to open the door so that many other people can come through and have the greatest opportunity that I am having. The state of South Carolina and this nation is, has offered me this opportunity, and I believe that they want me to go, so I will be at, take a woman's perspective from the state of South Carolina, which at this point we do not have. And so I'm looking to go to represent this state and this nation and do it from the perspective of a woman. And I believe I'm a very strong woman to do it. Senator. Thank you. Washington is broken. The fact of the matter is what we do is work for you, the people. At the end of the day, it's not about Republicans, it's not about Democrats, it's not about independents. It's about putting Americans first. We can see the brokenness of Washington when we look at a $17.6 trillion debt, annual deficits of over $700 billion. And in that environment, we come up with something that will not work, Obamacare. We come up with new regulations like Dodd-Frank that only create more oppression on those folks who would create jobs. But instead, they're paying the highest corporate tax rate in all of the world. Washington is broken. What I offer is common sense from South Carolina. Common sense starts with personal accountability to the voters here at home. That's one of the reasons why every weekend I come home to spend time talking to voters, listening to voters. I did a listening tour so that I could understand the issues that impact folks today. I went through and did many jobs. I went on a jobs tour. I, I rode public buses. I worked at a Moe's. I also uh, waited tables. I took the time so that I could understand and appreciate what people are going through today so that I could take their ideas. My best ideas aren't mine. I'm a conduit for the ideas of South Carolinians to find its way to Washington, D.C., so that we can fix a broken system. Andy. All right. How should the United States conduct itself in world affairs? Should we be a cop, a police officer that helps keep order, or should we have a more hands-off approach? Mrs. Dickerson. 
I think uh, knowing the situation that we're dealing with today with the ISA and ISIL, and knowing that our borders need to be protected at all times, I do believe that we, it is important and it is that we have hands on with our, our, our um, nation, with the national. But I am, I am very comfortable with the fact that we should have uh, people to contribute and I think we should be a, a hands on nation so that we can have the greatest dialogue between these countries where we can all work together so that we can all feel safe in our prospective nations. So yes, I believe that we should uh, have a hands-on approach. Senator Scott. Thank you. What we've seen and what we need to see from America is America first. We should involve ourselves in the world as long as it includes our national interests. The fact of the matter is when you look around the world, when America, the only superpower left on earth, withdraws itself completely from the world, we see absolute volatility and chaos. Whether it's Putin and Ukraine, whether it's China and Japan wrestling over land, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's Iran's push towards a nuclear weapon, we should stand strong and use our influence to help the world find order and structure. We do that by looking at our allies first. I, I always start with Israel because I believe that Psalms 122.6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and those who do will prosper. I believe it's very important that our allies understand that we are with them and that our enemies fear us. We should not spend money that we do not have buying influence that we're not obviously doing very well and doing things that are inconsistent with our best interests. If we are going to be successful and effective at helping the world progress, we are going to have to start by focusing on first, what is our national interest? How do we impact the world for our own best interest? Number two, how do we recognize and protect our allies who've come to the table with us? And number three, how do we make sure that our enemies respect us, if not fear us? If we don't do those three things, our involvement in the world will only lead to more chaos. And frankly, what we've seen so far is leading from behind. Red lines that don't Thank count. You, Thank you. Mrs. Bossy. Thank you. Um, obviously for me, this is personal. Any international decisions as it refers to ISIS or ISIL could impact my, my children. Um, therefore, I wanna make sure that we're using diplomacy first before we ever talk about using any other kinds of means. Obviously, America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth, and I agree with America first. That is the slogan of my campaign, America first. But I think that we need to take a new look, um, a new, if you will, um, uh, a new doctrine, a, a doctrine of containment, uh, much like the Truman uh, Doctrine that was done during World War II and as it uh, dealt with communism. I think here with the radical Islamic, uh, Islamic terrorists, we have to do the same kind of containment and begin to require that it be minimized. And we have to ask all of the countries that are in that area that are the most impacted by these issues to stand up and take their rightful place in the forefront. Um, whether it be Iraq, Iran, Syria, Turkey, Egypt, um, they all need to take their rightful place and take care of the problems that are existing in their area of the world. And yes, I agree with Senator Scott. We need to stand with Israel. Um, we, must, we must always be their allies and we must always protect them no matter what comes. But at the same time, I want to make sure that we're following a, a path of diplomacy and that we're using our economic might. Now, as we become more energy independent, we're going to be able to do so. Thank you. How would you tackle ISIS at this moment? And what do you think of the administration's response so far? Senator Scott. Thank you. I will tell you that all of us have relatives that are in the military. I think it's very important because what you see here are three dedicated Americans who care about the future of this country. Both of my brothers serve active duty today. One's command sergeant major in the Army, 31 years in. My other brother's a colonel in the Air Force. My dad retired Air Force. What I believe that when we look at ISIS, what we have to do is assess our responsibility in creating and coordinating a coalition of forces that starts with those folks who are in most imminent danger, folks living in the Middle East. What I think we have done well 
are our airstrikes. What I think we've done well is the collaboration, the coalition building that we've seen from countries around the globe coming to the, our assistance, seeing ISIS as a global threat to all nations. This has been an important step. What we must continue to do is make sure that the boots that are on the ground are the boots that live in the Middle East. It is very important for us to make sure that our Middle East partners are leading the way as it relates to actually the offensive. We can provide the air cover. We do that very well. We can provide the intelligence so that we know exactly where to strike and how to push back. That has been fairly effective. What we cannot do is what we have seen done, which is leading from behind. The administration got in the game very late and allowed ISIS to grow stronger when we could have stopped it early on. Ms. Bossy. Well, as I said before, and, um, and I'll say again, I, I do agree with some of the things that Senator Scott said. We must expect that the people in that area of the world are the ones that are taking the responsibility for their boots on the ground. And I applaud his brother's service um, and his father's service, but as a mother of an active duty U.S. Marine, um, and the mother of somebody who serves in the Air National Guard, I want to make sure that I am not sending my son or anybody else's son into harm's way. Um, we have done that before, and quite honestly, America cannot be the world's policeman. We need to use our, um, our diplomatic might. We need to use our economic might. We need to use our airstrikes uh, strategically, and, and then we need to use our, our, our strategy and our technologies to help to format um, that strategy within that region to help them battle it. Um, again, I go back to the idea of a doctrine of containment. I think we need to work very carefully with um, the countries in that area. And I think we're starting to see that in the way that Turkey is beginning to um, stand up and take on a greater role in the area. Again, I think we need to insist that that happen, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done diplomatically before we would ever consider going any further than providing the strategic airstrikes. And as far as what the current administration has done, again, I think that it's a little too little, a little too late. Um, but we need to keep a focus on it, and we cannot let it go because we cannot let that kind of evil stand. Thank you. Yes, I do agree with both Senator Scott and Ms. Bossy. I am the wife of a veteran. I have four brothers who served in the military. I have one bro a nephew who was a colonel. And I am very concerned about the situation in the Middle East. And I realize that Israel is our strongest ally. But I also realize and I believe that those nations need to take a little bit more responsibility for their own actions. We have been over there for a long time, almost 14 years. Our sons and our mil in, in the military and Ms. Boss's son and um, Senator Scott's brother, they have been there and I'm telling you it is time for our troops to come home. I think that airstrikes are the best way to resolve this issue at this point in time. I refuse to have more, put more troops on the ground in those countries because we are there, we're putting our troops in harm's way. Our borders need to be protected. The only way we can do that is to make sure that we continue to have a very, very strong military presence in the world. Yes, we are a superpower. And yes, we are looked at as one of the leaders in the world. Therefore, we need to continue that, keep that dialogue going, showing that we are a very strong nation, that we are not afraid. And yes, I do support my president because he is doing the job and he's putting everything he can to make sure that our borders are protected. Now, now, one of the things we have to understand, from my perspective, I do not have the privilege privilege of uh, having the intelligence that Senator Scott, I mean, I'm sorry, President Barack Obama has. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to change to the economy. Um, I suppose we have the, the 1992 presidential campaign to thank for one of the political catchphrases now. <laughs> it's the economy, stupid. Whatever else it may be, it's about the economy. And if it is all about the economy, what are your priorities? How do you achieve them? What's it going to cost? We'll start with Ms. Bossy. Thank you. Um, Aristotle said, the most perfect political community is one in which the middle class has control and outnumbers the other two. And I believe that that's a very accurate statement. 
Again, as I said earlier, the middle class has been eviscerated, and they are the most important part of our economy. We need to bring good jobs back home here to America, and I believe that we can do that. There are reshoring initiatives that are going on right now in corporate America that can bring good jobs back here that will create middle class jobs which provide good pay and benefits to those people that are qualified and have the training necessary. Obviously, we have to have a lot better education system, not only for pre-K through 12, but into our post-secondary education so that we are training people up to be able to uh, take those jobs on. Right now, we have over four million jobs in the country that go unfilled because we are lacking those ex uh, that experience. So we have a lot of opportunity to create jobs here, to innovate in America, to to look on a global scale and make sure that we're doing what is important, not only for America, but to create the answers that we need to create in the business community that will address our health care issues and that will address our economic issues and that will address, quite honestly, I believe, our immigration issues. So as we look at all of those things, I think a sound po economic policy can help bring us back out of the doldrums that we are currently in. Ms. Dickerson, economic priorities? My economic priorities will be to strengthen the middle class. All this, this during this past year, I, mean, I have been going all around the state, as I said earlier, sitting down at tables, talking to the people who are suffering, talking to those people who have lost their jobs, speaking to students who are overpaid, who have a high uh, um, uh, college loan debt. And this to me is so important. They are worried about how they're going to pay those college loans. So I believe that if we can strengthen our middle class, bring back jobs, open up the market so that people can go back and start to get those jobs that have gone overseas because we've given so many tax credits to people to take those jobs overseas and cause the middle class to decline. If the middle class decline, the world, the United States in my opinion, is on the decline because the rich get richer and the poor get poor. And if we do not sustain our middle class, I believe that this country is going to have a great downfall because that is the backbone. The middle class is the backbone of America. When you remove that status, you are going to have problems. So I would look at ways through education, I believe is one is the main thing, to make sure that we retrain workers to go into the workforce. And to me, that is the most important thing, is educating our workforce. Senator Scott, economic priority, how do you get it? Thank you. I'll tell you that our economy needs two things for it to grow and to prosper. We need certainty in the workplace, and we need predictability. Business owners and employers will hire people when those two things are there. They can actually deal with bad policy. They prefer not to, but they can. I was a, an employer. I was the CEO of my own company for about 13 years. And I will tell you that if I had certainty and predictability, I hired more people, invested in more equipment, and brought back an economy. What the government can do, which is an, which is an inter interesting point, what the government can do is a couple things. Number one, look at taxes and the regula regulations. We have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. We have seen Burger King and other companies looking to move their businesses out of our country so they can avoid the highest tax rate in the world. Regulations, Dodd-Frank, Obamacare, so many others actually add pressure that reduces the number of employees that can be hired, the amount of equipment that can be purchased. If we want to see a robust economy, we have to deal with certainty and predictability. We have to reduce taxes to make ourselves competitive. If you think about the fact that the corporate tax rate that we have is about 10 points higher than the rest of the world, I would also say that my opportunity agenda focuses on education, on skills in the workplace, providing people who want to go straight into the workforce the skills to do so. Follow South Carolina, we've done it really well. From Boeing to Michelin to BMW, South Carolina is a great place to do business because our regulations Thank and our taxes Thank are you. right. May I rebuttal on yeah. that? To which point? To the point that he made about Obamacare. You may. Okay, well, I hear this term all the time. And as I travel around the state, I've been hearing people say, Ms. Dickerson, uh, I don't want that Obamacare. But what we need to understand that that bill is not Obamacare. It is the affordable health care. And we need to make sure that that is the message that is taken and not just to say it is Obamacare because that is not what that bill is. Thank you. Uh, 
Ms. Bossy? I'd like to re uh, rebut on just the, the issue of taxes. Um, one of the problems we've got with our tax code is that it is so highly complex. It allows for companies to look at we had Apple moving over to Ireland, and luckily the Irish have changed that, that law. We had uh, Burger King looking to move to Canada, et cetera. What we have to do is simplify our tax system. I agree that we need to bring taxes down, not only for corporations, but also for individuals. We need to get a fair, flat tax that simplifies the tax code, reduces the amount of IRS, and quite honestly allows business to generate a lot, a lot more jobs and a lot more business. I've heard you all talk about helping the middle class and presumably perhaps even the working class uh, what about the minimum wage it's it's seven and a quarter an hour the federal minimum wage what would you do to change that and to try and perhaps contract the uh, the wealth gap between the wealthy and and the the less so start with Ms. Dickerson that is a very personal thing with me when I tr as I stated earlier and I heard uh, senator, the selected senator, we have to realize that our senator is the, the selected senator and not the elected senator. So I want, I heard him say earlier that he went around to various places and doing minimal jobs. I wonder did he ask them whether or not $7.25 an hour was a good wage for them. Uh, the working class, the middle class is declining as I stated before. They are declining because people have to work two, three jobs. 20 hours a week just to try to make a balanced wage so that they can put food on their table, educate their kids, and take care of their families. We are living in a crisis situation when a person lose their job, their whole livelihood go down the tube. And so I think that we should, I fully support raising the minimum wage from $7.25 an hour to $10.10 an hour. Now I'm hearing that that is going to cause us to, uh, you know, to lose jobs. Well, you know, we don't have the stats to prove that. And since we don't have the stats to prove that raising the minimum wage is going to cause you to lose jobs, I will stick with the fact that we need to seriously wage, raise the minimum wage so that our people can have, the people in South Carolina can have a decent lifestyle. Senator, how about those folks that you worked with? Absolutely. When I talk to the folks that I worked with, uh, from those to waiting on tables to working at the Goodwill, riding the bus, the one common denominator that was glaringly obvious is that the educational achievement has major impact on your lifetime earning. When I was a kid struggling in high school as a freshman, about to f drop out, Literally, if a kid drops out as a freshman in high school, they lose more than a million dollars in lifetime income. What I learned was that so many of our folks are begging. They are interested and hungry, looking for ways to improve their education. I've suggested in my opportunity agenda that we do it two ways. One way is to fo f focus on the four-year college. The other one is what I had when I was in high school, something called SHOP giving people real work skills so that they can go right into the workforce. I visited a company here in South Carolina who've done that so well. They have a program where they can earn and learn at the same time, MTU in Aiken, South Carolina. What I would suggest that we do is make sure that we focus on poverty. If we can eradicate poverty, the fastest way to do so is through increasing the educational achievement. This will actually help us have the same challenges on the top end that we are talking about today on the minimum wage. We've had great success stories, Spartanburg, Greenville, today they are almost at full employment. So the wages are going up by $2.50 an hour at companies that I visited just last week. That is Thank very you. important consideration for us to have. Thank you, Ms. Bossy, minimum wage. Thank you. Um, one of the things that Jesus said was, we will always have the poor with us. And while I would love to see poverty eradicated, the reality is that it will always be there and we have to work towards supporting those people. As it refers to the minimum wage, um, I, I am somewhere in between. I, I do believe that the minimum wage has not been raised since 2009 and our economy has faltered and stumbled and it is an important thing that we need to reassess and, and reevaluate. At the same time, I believe that by bringing jobs back, we will, be able to um, create jobs that the middle class um, workers that are trained and that have the skills, et cetera, can take. And that will create a supply and demand in the minimum wage jobs for younger people, for people who want to supplement their income, for people who it is not 
that, that job that they need full time to support their families. A minimum wage is not a living wage, and so we need to recognize that. Um, I also believe that at the same time as we look at the, uh, the educational opportunities, it's important that we recognize that it's not just hyperbole. It's not just what we talk about, but it's what we do. So what we've got to be able to support our education from pre-K through high school. We've got to be able to support our college students as they enter and they create massive debt. We've got to look at training programs for when they come out of college. We've got to create trade and technical schools. All of those things are going to be important to help us adjust the, middle, uh, the minimum wage here in the U.S. Andy? <clears throat> Senator Scott. You voted against the immigration reform that was backed by Senator Graham and that the South Carolina agriculture and tourism industries considered vital for the state's economy and, for pro and its prosperity. So what solution do you have for the immigration issue? The, the reality of immigration is a, an important issue for the workforce and we should find ways to make sure that we have the workers that we need to make sure that we continue to build the best economy in the world. When I think about the immigration issue, I think first about the legal immigration process. I think about my sister-in-law who came here from Korea and spent about 10 years getting her citizenship. She learned about this country. She focused on the success and the opportunities and she seized upon it. For us to create a system that we reward folks in a way because of the way that they came here, uh, I think would be inconsistent with what we want to accomplish. The ways that we start the process on immigration reform starts with our borders. We first must secure our borders. By doing so, we need three basic parts. Number one, we need more human capital on the border. Number two, we need physical obstructions to stop them from coming across. And number three, we must make sure that we have technology used 24-7 because our borders are not simply an immigration issue. They are today a national security issue. Imagine if you saw terrorists coming across our borders, we would find ourselves in a serious position. The second thing that you do is you fix the visa system. The fact of the matter is that I believe that after we secured our border, we could absolutely increase the number of visas, whether those are starting jobs or whether those are STEM visas, in order to make sure that we have the workforce that we need in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Bossy, how would yes. you address the immigration issue? Well, I think the first thing is obviously we have to secure our borders. And we've got a big problem. We've got estimated over 11 million illegal immigrants in the country. That's not going to be something we can deal with with the snap of a finger overnight. We have to address it long term. We have to redo, if you will, our immigration um, our immigration legislation and make sure that the requirements that we have are sound and strong so that the people that should stay here are able to work their way toward um, legal citizenship or legal alien status. But I think it's important too to note that not only has Senator Scott voted against immigration, but he's voted against the budget. He's voted against infrastructure. He's voted against equal pay. He's voted against minimum wage. He's voted against Medicare access. He's voted against military justice. There's so many things that he's voted against and very little that he's voted for. And I think that that's part of the, part of the problem that we're facing. We've got to start working on solutions. And whatever that solution is, there are very smart and intelligent people that can sit down together and come together and devise a solution that will create a good immigration plan and policy for the U.S. that will secure our borders and won't end up costing billions and billions more and have that money wasted and at the same time create that pathway to citizenship that so many people strive to have. And again, if I go back to the idea of building minimum, uh, building middle, uh, the middle class back up, if we do that, we can also potentially create global jobs which will keep the people at home because that's why they're coming here. Mrs. Dickerson. <clears throat> Mrs. Dickerson. Well, I do believe that we, first of all, have got to protect our borders. That's the first thing. And that's the one thing probably Ms. Boss and I are going to probably agree on tonight, and that is that Senator Scott, uh, I think we would have probably had a better economy if Senator Scott, you know, knew the word yes on some of these issues. Because as she has stated, he has voted against a student. Um, he, did not, he did not show up for the vote when we were talking about refinancing student loans. And so 
I know this is not a border issue, but I know that when we talk about securing our borders, we have got to make sure that the immigration persons that are here, that we make sure that they go through the process and that we make sure that they get legalized and go through that process so that they can become legal citizens in the United States because they are costing American jobs. And because they're taking away jobs from America, I think it's so important that we make sure that they get this process straight, straight like we all have done and that they do the process that all Americans and all the citizens who have come into the United States go through the process, get legalized and, and work for. But I do believe that if we had a better working Congress with people who are working together to try to resolve problems rather than create problems, then we will have a more secure and our immigration problem will be taken care of. Your directive. You rebuttal. May. You Thank may, you. Yes. I just want to make sure that I, I clear up the fact that I actually voted to reduce the interest rates on those student loans that when I had the opportunity to, and I think my overall congressional voting record is over 99%. Thanks. Good. Well, we have two women on the stage, so let's go ahead and ask. What is your stance on reproductive rights and assuring equal pay for equal work? Um, I believe it is uh, Ms. <laughs> Mrs. Bothy's turn. Thank you. Well, you know, this is one of those hot button issues that politicians love to throw around. Quite honestly, I think that the issue of reproductive rights has already been addressed in America, and I wish that we would stop pushing that so hard um, and start dealing with the problems that we do have. We talk so much about reproductive rights and yet we don't take care of our children. How many children do we have that are hungry? How many children do we have that are homeless? How many children do we have that are lacking the, the very basic needs that they, ha that, they, that they have a need for? We have to start dealing with the issues that we have and stop worrying about what people are doing. I am a woman and I stand for a woman's right to choose. Um, I know that my God um, has given me the right to choose whether or not to believe in him. And therefore, I believe that he's given me the right to choose on anything that I do with my life and how I conduct my life. So I have to believe that if the creator of the universe has given me that choice, that he's also given me the ability to make the choice on reproductive rights. And when it comes to equal pay, this is something that's very personal for me. I know as somebody who worked their way up, I started out as a single parent and I started out in a minimum wage job and I worked hard all of my life to get my college education and, and take on new and harder jobs. But I knew in every single job that there was a man that was earning more than I was. And right now I believe it's 82 cents on the dollar. We have to correct that. It's not an easy answer, but we have to start working on it. Mrs. Dickerson. Well, that, you know, that is very much an issue that is very close to my heart. And I believe I started when I said that God gave us a choice from day one from the garden. He gave us a choice when he said that he put all those trees in the garden. And he said, of all those trees you could eat of except one. So from day one, God gave us a choice. And I definitely believe in choice. I believe that a woman should have the right to choose. I had a serious problem, and I've been saying this a lot. I had a serious problem when the five justices voted in favor of Hobby Lobby, which was against women's right to choose. And I think it's an insult for companies to charge women more for insurance just because they are a woman. Women and girls deserve to have the same opportunity as men. They did that for our contraceptives, but they didn't say a word about Viagra. But I tell you, I am very much concerned about that, so I support choice. I think that a woman should have the right to choose, and that should be between her husband husband, her God, and her doctor. And as long as those three are in agreement, then I think that is the best choice. And as for waging the, the uh, equal pay for women, I think, now the problem, herein lies the problem. We talk about 80, I've heard, see that's the thing about stats. Some are different. So with it's Hispanics, it's cheaper. Black African American is lower, white females is different. So there's a big span. We need to fix the women issue first, and then we can go to the equal pay. Senator Scott. I'm certainly pro-life, number one. And number two, I would tell you that Hobby Lobby was, in fact, an issue of religious liberty, which I support with the decision by the Supreme Court. I will tell you that I had the opportunity to bring Carly Fiorina, a young lady who went from being a secretary at Healer Packard to becoming the CEO of HP. I'll tell you what she has taught me about the issue of equal pay. 
The fact of the matter is we all know that since 1962 or 1963, it's been illegal to discriminate, but it hasn't stopped it. And her research has led to a very important conclusion that the seniority system as we know it today actually benefits men and discriminates to some extent against women. And let me explain. The fact of the matter is when a woman decides to leave the workforce uh, to have a family, what ultimately happens is when she comes back into the workforce, because of the seniority system, because of the longevity of the people there, they get paid more. So no matter how hard she works, no matter how well she performs, the fact of the matter is that she does not catch up from where she was. So if we eliminated the seniority system and went to a meritocracy, where we actually decided to pay people based on how well they did their job, that women would fare much better in the workforce. This is one of the silver bullets that Carly Fiorina helped me understand and appreciate. So I look forward to focusing much of our time in the future on addressing some of the challenges that we face. And I am very thankful Thank that you. she was willing to come to South Glen. Like Thank to, you. I've got, like I've got two hands up. We'll start with Ms. Boss. Thank you. So uh, as a woman, um, I, I'm very glad that Senator Scott has finally decided to investigate the issues that women deal with. But I will be very honest in terms of saying that it is not just the fact that women go out to raise their children. That kind of equal pay discrimination happens. I am the breadwinner for my family. I never stayed at home with my children. That is something that my husband did for our family. And I was discriminated against job after job after job. It meant moving positions to increase my salary. So do not go with the wife, old wives tale, if you will, or old husbands tale, perhaps, that it is because women have to leave their jobs to have families. That is blarky. And, Ms. Dickerson, uh, 30 seconds for I, I really like to con con concur with what she said, because I, today it just disturbs me when I see a woman who is, who is having a baby, expecting an expecting mother, who works up almost to the day she had the baby, and right after she had the baby, she is back on the job within a matter of a few days. So for someone to use the excuse that women have to leave the workforce, well, we do more work while we are there than the average man because we are always there almost 24 seven. We spend more time on our jobs and so I will have a serious problem when they say that we leave the workforce and we don't put in the time, we do. Thank you. I want to turn to a different subject and it's, it, it's kind of the balance between between federal and state responsibilities. The specific thing I have in mind is something that's very relevant to South Carolina. It's the cost of, of uh, expanding the Charleston Harbor, which is, as I understand it, is gonna be about half a billion dollars, and the split is about 40% federal and 60% state, if I've got that approximately right. I'd like to know, are you for it? Is this a fair uh, breakdown between state and federal uh, responsibilities, and, and what you're willing to do to achieve Achieve that. We start with Ms. Dickerson on I this I think one. this is a wonderful idea, and that is one of the reasons why I am so against drilling on our shores. I think expanding our shores has been the greatest thing for South Carolina. It's going to expand our tourism dollars. We, South Carolina, one of the greatest economic uh, things that we have in South Carolina is the fact that we have a great tourism and our and our borders are so important so I am all in favor of seeing that expansion because I know it's going to bring more revenue into our state it's going to it's stimulate our economy to the point that we'll have more jobs coming here so I just believe that this is a very very good move and I and I support it 100 percent and as I stated I do think that this is a great thing and I will not you know, be in favor of anyone drilling on our beautiful shores. I think those shores need to be protected. I'm all in favor of protecting those shores from big oils because when you notice people who actually support big oils, they say follow the dollar. And as you follow the dollar, you'll find out how those things are being taken care of and why we support what we do. So I support it. I think it's a great idea for the economy of South Carolina. Senator, the, the balance between federal and state responsibilities for the harbor? Yeah, I'm not sure if we would <clears throat> agree with a 60-40 split, but the fact of the matter is that is a split. The, the good news is that the State House set aside $300 million to make sure that we had the money necessary to move forward with the port. Good news as well, the water bill that just passed that I voted for 
provided more money to help that port happen as well. And finally, there's about a $40 million that we need to figure out uh, along the way. The good news, from my perspective, from my days on county council, I will tell you that the port being in my backyard when I was Charleston County Council Chairman was a very important part of the economic driver. One out of every seven jobs in South Carolina is connected to the port. This is a major economic engine. One of the things that we saw, we, we celebrated the success of the inland, port, in, inland rail that provides more ways to get the goods from upstate to the, the, to the port, which is very important for us to continue to be successful. Uh, when I was on County Council, we worked very hard to bring, attract more business. One of the things that we used to sell was in fact the port. When I was in the State House, when we were recruiting Boeing and had the largest economic announcement in the world, or in the country, excuse me, in the year 2009, one of the things that we saw that was a major asset for us was the port. The good news for South Carolina is that America's port is in South Carolina. There is something called the Harbor Maintenance Fund, $5.7 billion on a balance sheet in Washington that could be used to fund the Charleston Port, the Jasper Port, the Georgetown Port, and it would actually allow us to have a vibrant competition and see us meet our goals of doubling the exports from this country. Thank you. Ms. Bossett. Well, so I agree with uh, both Senator Scott and Ms. Dickerson that the Charleston Harbor project is absolutely essential to the state of South Carolina, and I'm in favor of it. The 60-40 split, if that was what was negotiated, then that's what we have to live with, and obviously the state has planned for it, the federal government has planned for it. Let's get it done, because the longer that we hold off on it, the higher those costs go, and I believe that the costs have gone high while we've been talking about it. I think what's also important is that we look at other infrastructure projects, and we make sure that we're, I've traveled all over the state, and let me tell you, our highways stink. Um, I have been, my brains have been rattled by how many potholes we have on, on 77 and 95 and 26 and 20. We have to put more money into our infrastructure all over, and that's our ports, our harbors, our roads, um, our bridges. Those are all essential, and I think we need to find a way to do that because not only will that help us all as citizens, but it also will start to put people back to work in good middle class paying jobs. And I think that that's important. So I'm in big support of the harbor. I, I believe that the, the split is an equitable one and it's a return on investment. The state has to be willing to invest in the projects that it wants the federal government to invest in. And once that investment is done, the return on that through um, cruise lines, through shipping lines, through um, trade that comes in are all going to pay off um, handsomely for the state. Uh, the hour is waning. I'm going to ask you for a shorter response to this question from Andy. Uh, see if we can do it in about 45 seconds. Sure. One, of the <clears throat> one of the things on a lot of folks' mind are going to be Medicare. How do we keep it going? How do we sustain it? As of course, again, for your, as, you as some of you have mentioned, for your children, for your grandchildren. So how do we sustain Medicare for the future? Uh, Senator Scott. Thank you. Well, one of the first ways that we could help sustain Medicare for the future is to take a look back at Obamacare, where we saw $716 billion siphoned from Medicare in order to encourage or incent young people to buy insurance. I don't think our seniors should be subsidizing the health care cost of our, of our young Americans. That's one of the most important things that we can do. The other thing that we have to take a look at is when you look at Medicare, the number, of the, the number for waste, fraud, and abuse is around 9%. The average in corporate America is closer to 2%, 1%. So if we were to look into Medicare and to look for ways for us to reduce waste, fraud, and abuse, we would see a path forward. What we do know is that the health care cost or- Senator Scott, thank you. Okay. Thanks. This is bossy. Um, as far as health care in general is concerned, we need to protect Medicare. Um, I had my two parents um, were uh, 1915. My father was born in 1922. They were absolutely dependent on Medicare. But Medicare is a good program. It's a sound program. We need to strengthen it. We need to keep it going. But I think that we need to look at the holistic issue of health care in America. Um, whether you call it the ACA or you call it Obamacare, we need to look at that. We need to look at our veterans. We haven't talked about them. And they deserve not to be homeless, not to be hungry and to have the health care that they deserve. So we need to look at it holistically, bring everybody together and bring the, the insurance companies to the table, the medical exper experts to the table, and come up with a plan that provides the kind of insurance that all of America needs. 
This is Dickerson. Well, I have been hearing about a lot about Medicare, and one of the things I'm hearing is the privatization of Medicare. This is something that I, I don't think is very much is on my mind. So I believe that we have got to really make sure that we protect our seniors, protect their investment. Now, some people call that entitlement, and, ba and I, I made this mistake and I said Medicare, but I t some people call it entitlement. But I believe when I got my paycheck, Ms. Bossy got her paycheck, Senator Scott got his paycheck, we saw that they deducted that cost from our paychecks. So how can you say that that is entitlement? You earned it, and I think you deserve it, and I will support Medicare and make sure that we protect it because it is vital to all of the citizens. This is the last question, and you get about 20 seconds to answer it. If elected, you only get a two-year term, mm -hmm. the unexpired term that uh, Senator Jim DeMitt left behind. So win or lose, what have you learned about the American political process that you would address differently next time? And a, yeah, 20 seconds. How are you going to do that? Term limits and campaign finance reform. Tim Scott has raised $6.438 million, and that's come 16% from the state of South Carolina and all the rest from out Outside. Our country is being bought and paid for. We have to change that. That is what I would focus my first two years on to implement term limits and campaign finance reform. One dollar for every registered voter. Thank you. What's the, what's the lesson? My lesson is that I think that term limits is not a very really good thing because it, if when you are in office, you will notice that sometimes it takes a considerably amount of time to get some of the projects taken care of. So term limits will not work for me. And I do think, I don't know about campaign refinance reform, but Senator Scott got a lot of money to beat me with none. You may have a lot of money, but you only have 20 seconds. <laughs> Common ground. Uh, our nation is the greatest nation on earth. We are exceptional, and if we do what we're supposed to do, we will see the most amazing, amazing things happen. I've learned very quickly that working together creates major opportunities for success. I've worked with my conservative friends, with my liberal friends, and we all have one thing in common. Thank you. We put America first. Ah, uh, thank you uh, to all of the Senate candidates. Thanks as well to Andrew Shane of the state for being with us. For more information on all the upcoming, well, there aren't any more upcoming debates, but keep tabs on what's happening uh, in the election process. And don't forget to vote next Tuesday. I'm Charles Bierbauer. Good night.